this is the Provoke Brawn, and this is the Deep Cool CK560WH. This is a mid tower case, and in this video, I'm going to be showing you the build process for it and talking about the highlights. I'm also going to show the various different features and specs and discuss what's included, what you can install in it, and also the capabilities. And obviously, at the end of the video, I will also be showing off the benchmarks to show you how it performed and the quality of that and I also want to talk to you about just the general highlights and things of interest. One of the things of interest is that it comes with three RGB fans pre-installed but one non-RGB fan at the rear which I thought was kind of strange to be honest. However it is remarkably quiet as I'll show later on. I was actually really impressed by how quiet it is and you can also see a deep cool tower cooler that I've done a video on separately that's installed in here as well and I will be showing the installation process for that in this video but if you want to find out more separately about it please check out the link in the description below. I'll also leave the specs of the build down there as well so you can find out more about what's been installed. And I'm using an NZXT N7 Z590 motherboard with an Intel CPU setup and a couple of NVMe SSDs and a 3060 Ti. But you can see from various angles that the deep cool case actually looks quite nice. Things I was struck by when I first got out of the box is it's remarkably lightweight and it has an interesting look to the front of it with all these crosses on the front. Also, as you saw, a dust filter on the front too, and there's another dust filter on top, and one underneath where the PSU sits. Now, this is designed to be spacious, so it can hold up to a 380mm GPU, and also tall CPU coolers as well, so that's worth bearing in mind. Configuration of the fan setup, you have 320mm on the front of standard, and one 120mm at the back. You can have up to six 120mm case fans and potentially a number of different radiators. So let's say you can fit a 360mm radiator on the front for example or two 280mm radiators, one on the front, one on the top. And one of the things that you can see there is there's some difficulty getting the door off and that's because of a weird design which actually I think will be beneficial because it will make it more secure and basically makes it a little bit tricky to get off and on. And one of the reasons why that I'll demonstrate now is essentially there are clips in two different places. So at the bottom you have two clips and then you have a ridge that runs along the side. So you kind of have to slide it into the bottom clips first and then slide it across, which is pretty unusual, and then obviously holding it down with thumb screws. Pretty quirky and a bit annoying for taking it on and off, but actually really potentially good for sort of long-term use because if you're moving it around it's definitely not going to come off. Now one of the other interesting design highlights includes a little GPU sag bracket, so an anti-sag bracket on the side here which you can adjust in and out and reposition. You'll also notice that there are two notches on either side of the cabling holes here and that means that you can use that bracket and move it around depending on the size of your GPU. So I'm using quite a small GPU as you might have noticed from the beginning shots. So in the current position it's actually not very useful. But don't worry because I'll show you how to position it later on. You'll notice that the case is also able to hold ITX, Micro ATX, ATX and EATX motherboards. And you have labelling for where you put the standoff screws depending on which one you've got set up. I'm using ATX motherboard. So I've actually got these screws basically pre-set up for me. But you do have extra ones included in the box. Now I feel like this case has a kind of a cheap feel to it. It feels kind of light and cheap and not very fancy in several ways. However, it is actually really nice that they've included multiple fans. You don't generally get a lot of fans included with a case. And as I'll show, it's actually possible to run this case with just that many fans and get a pretty good cooling out of it and reasonable peace and quiet out of there too. You can install two 2.5 inch SSDs and two 3.5 inch hard disk drives and then you have a mass of cables at the back. The fans are all connected up and another highlight of it is it also have an RGB controller at the top and I'll talk a bit more about that later on but that means the front fans RGB is already controlled and also basically all the cables for daisy chained as well apart from that rear one all the cables for power are also daisy chained and ready to go so you just need to plug in one cable into your motherboard or two if you want to control the RGB lighting from a compatible motherboard which is another point I'll talk about later on. So interesting setup as you can see there. 
Now, one of the small annoyances that I think is worth talking about briefly is the packaging of the screws and things. These are held in the hard disk drive bay, and in there you'll find a bag which has everything in it, but they're all just crammed in the same bag. So if you're a new builder, this might seem a bit intimidating because there's a lot of different screws. This is the RGB cable that I was talking about. So this is a separate cable that you can use to connect up the fans to your motherboard if you want RGB synced controls from there. And then you'll find a tiny little bag that's full of a load of different screws, which might seem a bit crazy and you think, oh my God, which one, what do I do with all of these? I'm gonna talk you through that process now, but you can see a close up look at them. They basically bundled them all in together. Usually you'd see these separated out to avoid confusion. So a bit of an oversight, but I suppose it uses less plastic. So that's definitely a nice thing for Deep Cool to do because good for the environment. But I'm gonna basically set these out into groups so that I can work out which ones do what and then I'm gonna show you the process for that. And that's gonna take some time, so set some time aside for just messing about with screws. But if you refer to the manual, you'll see there's a screw sleeve, power supply unit screws, motherboard screws, standoffs, SSD screws, hard disk drive screws, fan screws, and also more. So this is the standoff screws. These are what you need if you want to install a different size motherboard. So you'd use those to put into the case. These are the SSD screws. So you screw those into the SSDs and then the mounting points on the case as well. I'll show you that in a second. These are the power supply unit screws. So you have sort of chunky top on top of there. Just pay attention to that. This is the motherboard screw. So small screws with a very sort of round top to them and then a cross head on top of that. Fan screws you can see there and you don't really need those necessarily. And again, refer to the manual if you need to, but the hard disk drive tray pops out at the rear with relative ease. You see, you don't need any tools to get that out. One thing I've noticed is that tray is also removable. It's held in place with a thumb screw that you can see there. So you can take it out if you're not planning on using hard disk drives, but the drive process is pretty straightforward. This tray mounts quite simply around your drive. And you'll notice that the bay itself has multiple pins in it. So you can take those pins and position them so they slip into those on the drive itself. Obviously facing it downwards and towards the rear of the case so that you can then put in the data cable and power cable with ease and run those through. Talking about cables in a minute, I actually found there's not much room for managing those cables. You'll notice there's also two holes on the sides of this tray and then you can find the screws for that. So then screw that in and hold it in. I don't actually know if this is 100% necessary. I suppose it depends on whether you're moving your case around a lot. But obviously it's already clipped into this tray. This is just extra secure. So you're now securing it in screws as well as those little clips. I think it'll probably be fine with just the clips. But if you want to be sure your hard drives aren't going to move around at all, it'll be fine. If you're in setting this up, however, and then just putting it on your desk and it's never going to move, you probably don't need to worry about this, I would say. And then the power supply cable and data cable. So this is the data cable that you'd connect up there and then connect the other end up to your motherboard and then the SATA power. So this is the flat power connector that connect up to your power supply unit. I've done a separate video on power supply units, but I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute and how you set up the cables if you're not too sure. Now, as I said, you can fit two 3.5 inch hard disk drives down here and you'll see it's actually fairly spacious down here. In a minute, you'll see me fit in a RM850 power supply unit from Corsair, 850 watt with relative ease and still have plenty of space down there as well. Now, the SSD installation is fairly straightforward. These are basically little screws that screw in one side into the SSD and then basically push into a notch. So they're actually relatively easy. You can do it with your thumb, but you will notice that there is a little screw hole on top. So you could use a screwdriver as necessary. I didn't find it necessary. It's really easy just to screw these in like that. And then basically they're just gonna pop into the holes on the back of the case. Again, making sure that you're putting in the cables. So it's the same logic with the cables. We need power from the SATA connection and then the data connection that will plug in to your motherboard. I'm not actually gonna be using these drives, so you'll see later on they're not actually in the final build, but I just wanted to be able to demonstrate how you'd set them up for you in case you're doing it. And these two drives mount on the rear of the case behind where the motherboard's gonna sit. And you can see that there's four holes in two different positions. Basically, you're just pushing them through to the other side. Pretty interesting. So where the hard disk drives held in with multiple clips and screws, this is just basically just pushed in like this. Now, this is the RM850 power supply unit that I was talking about. I've done a video separately that goes into more depth on how you connect all these cables up, but I'm going to briefly show some of what you need to plug in. 
So this is the 24 pin motherboard power supply cable, the chunkiest one split into two parts. This is the most important cable. If you don't plug this in properly, you won't have any power to the motherboard and your PC won't boot. So if it won't boot, that's most likely the problem. Make sure you connect up both parts of that and then the chunky longer bit will connect up to your motherboard and I'll show you the process for that in a minute. But you can see that plugs in on the top right. You then have CPU power cables and this motherboard actually requires two different connections, an eight pin and a four pin. So I'm gonna connect up two of these cables to the part mount CPU on the right hand side here. You can see it says PCIe slash CPU and I'm gonna connect up two of them. This cable actually splits into two parts on one side. Obviously the part mark CPU is what plugs into the motherboard and how you connect that up. And the other part plugs into the power supply unit. This is the flat SATA power connectors. You'll need this for both the RGB controllers and for anything else that you might be using. So SSDs, hard disk drives, or additional fan controllers, things like that. And then a PCIe connector cable, that is for the graphics card. And again, that goes into the PCIe slash CPU power point there on the power supply unit. That's the majority of cables that I'm going to be needing for this build. So relatively straightforward. You might find you need a few more, but this process is fairly straightforward. And as I said, check out the video in the description if you want to find out and see more about that. Then you mount the power supply unit with the fan facing down towards the bottom so it can suck cold air in from underneath the case and push it out of the rear. Worth noting some pretty decent feet on this case as well, so it will have plenty of space on the desk to get air to the power supply. There are four screws included in the box that I showed you earlier. They basically have a little flat chunky bit on top and you also get four of these screws in the power supply unit case as well. So you'll find you actually have eight screws, which is more than you need. So don't worry, but you have the option to use either set basically. So basically make sure that is secured down into the case nice and tight so it won't move around. Now we're getting into the action of basically setting things up. There are some cable loops on the case here. In various spots there are a few different cable tie loops so you can basically loop them up and tie your cables down. I actually found there isn't that much room here and there's no cable channeling. I've seen certainly seen fancier cases from other manufacturers with cable channeling. However the logic of where the cable tidying loops are positioned is really useful. So what I'm doing is running the two 8-pin CPU power connectors along the side and the rear, securing them up so that they're ready to go. Also just tying them down to the various loops along the point. You'll notice that there's a bit that juts out from the back of the motherboard where the CPU would be. And along the side of that is where the loops come out, which is fairly strange. I've also connected up the 24-pin power supply unit cable and tied that down too. Now the little RGB controller at the top, that requires SATA power, so make sure that's plugged in. You'll notice that it has a note to unplug it if you're planning on connecting the RGB directly to the motherboard because you don't want both. So just pay attention to that. I'm going to show you what that means a bit later on, but basically that controller gives you the ability to control the RGB lighting with just a button press on the case. Relatively straightforward and actually a really nice addition, so it's nice to see that. So here is the CPU cooler. This is the tower cooler from Deep Cool, and I'll link to that video in the description, as I said, but this is actually a neat addition because it's white, so it goes nicely with the white case, and it also runs really quietly. And the setup process for this is fairly straightforward as well. So I'm just gonna go into that now and demonstrate what you do there. You'll see that it has multiple different setups for AMD and Intel, and it will work with a variety of different motherboard sockets. I'm actually using LGA 1200, but it will work with LGA 1700, 1150, 1151, 2066, and others. A really nice looking tower cooler with some fans that are already pre-installed so that you can get cooling your CPU really effectively. It also comes with thermal paste. What you will notice is it also has two power cables for the fans and you do need to connect them up to the CPU fan header on your motherboard. There is also a Y splitter cable included in the box, so you can basically connect those two fans to one connection on the motherboard, and I'll show you where in a minute. So this is a nice cooler, and actually, as I've shown in that other video, it runs really quietly as well and is 
pretty decent. So the setup process for this is actually fairly similar depending on what Intel build you're doing. So this is an Intel build, that's what I'm going to show you now. Basically this backplate goes on the rear of the motherboard and you'll see there are various different pins that you need to position depending on which socket of motherboard you're using. So I'm using the 1200 sockets, I'm going to put them into that position. And if you refer to the manual it shows you where you need to put them. So we're maneuvering those around into a position where they will be correct for our build. And you reach to the back of the motherboard and we're essentially just going to push this through. Now you can do this once the motherboard's installed in the case. I actually find it easier to do it beforehand because I want to be able to easily access some of the connections and also to be able to demonstrate to you so you can see it clearly. Basically just pushing that back plate through, putting the little pins through to the front and then we're going to secure it in place. One of the things of note though is this is quite a large tower cooler so once you install it in the case as we'll see a bit later on it does make things a little bit fiddly in terms of trying to plug in the top power connectors. So you'll see on this motherboard there's a 8 pin and a 4 pin CPU power connector on the top left of it and that's a little bit fiddly to get access to once the motherboard's installed. So with that back plate in place you then use these screws, thumb screws that are screwed down on top of those are essentially standoffs for the brackets that we're going to be putting on in a second. So those go into the four different corners and are tightened down to hold the back plate down so that it's nice and secure on the rear and then you can put the CPU cooler down on top once we've installed the other brackets. The really nice thing about this deep cool tower is it's really easy to set up because it also works with multiple different CPU sockets but it's also designed to be compatible in that it's basically the same setup process with just some ever so slight tweaks. So slightly different positions on the back plate and slightly different positions on the brackets that sit on top of these screws and I'll show you what I mean there in a second. So once all the thumb screws are down we're then installing these brackets. There are two symbol brackets and there are multiple notches on them so you can see them labelled 1, 2 and 3 and depending on what CPU socket motherboard you're using it will be the position of where the standoffs sit through on those points. So for 1200 socket I'm using position 1. Refer to the manual and you'll find references to which ones you should use. Obviously this is going to vary depending on your setup and you might not even be using this with the case but I thought it would be worth demonstrating in case you're curious and want to find out the process for this as well. I've obviously pre-installed the CPU here and we need to ready that in a minute with thermal paste. I'm going to do a video separately on this motherboard as well to talk about the various setup processes for that. Now once these brackets are in place you then put some more screws on top of those. Again these are thumb screws to secure the brackets down to basically those standoffs that we've installed. So then you've got a basically a tight system that's holding the back plate in place and brackets on top of that and then we'll seat the CPU cooler down on top of this. We then go about the process of tightening those up and making sure they're all nice and tight. Now there are two cables coming out of the CPU tower cooler which need to be addressed. Those are power cables for the fans obviously and these are PWM controllable fans so you want to use a PWM header on your motherboard and because they're CPU fans anyway we're going to connect them up to the CPU fan header. You usually find there's only one of those, sometimes you might find two but there's a Y splitter cable included in the box with this one so you're basically connecting up both fans into a single cable. So this black cable then puts a single cable into the CPU fan header which you'd set. And you need to find somewhere for these cables to go though because it's an excess of cable now that we have to deal with once it's inside the case. But as I said earlier on I'm doing this all outside the case because it's a little bit easier to put the CPU fan cable into the motherboard. So here's another look. This is the NZXT N7 Z590 motherboard. I'm using an Intel 11th gen CPU setup here, basically because it's a little bit more affordable than the current gel. And so here's a look at the motherboard before I went about installing other things. And you'll see that the CPU power connectors are in the top left. We also have RGB controllers that you could use and the top right as well and then there's a CPU fan header up there as well on the left next to the power cables. Those are what we'll be using there. Now I'm going to show off some of the parts of the setup for this build. So I'm using a WD Black SN850. I'm also using a Samsung drive which is randomly in one of those boxes. Some Kingston Fury RAM. So there's 32 gigs of Kingston Fury RAM and the Intel CPU. So this is an i7-11700K. 
So I'm going back to front and some of the installations since you've already seen the CPU set up, but just in case you don't know how, basically list that lever up and then we put in the CPU down by ensuring that the little gold arrow is pointing to the bottom left, putting it in very gently and then reseating the cover as so and making sure that clip goes in and then you'll find the plastic cover comes off and then that's ready and done. You know, be gentle with all of that because you don't want to damage any of the pins in the process. Then the Kingston Fury RAM is going to be installed as well. And you have to make sure that you install this in the proper way. I've only got two sticks of RAM, so you have to need to be careful to install them in the right slots on the motherboard because there are four different DDR slots on here and it's DDR4 RAM as well. DDR4 motherboard, it will only take DDR4, so don't try and install DDR5. But you'll see that there are four different points and you actually need the second and the fourth one if you're looking left to right. So I'm doing the fourth one first, randomly. And if you're using two sticks, you need to make sure you put those in those slots. Don't get them in the wrong slots or your PC will have problems. Face them away from the CPU and connect them up. Again, second and fourth are the slots you need to connect up and just push them in until you hear it click. Now there are two NVMe SSD slots on here and you'll notice that we have a large sort of front plate protective shielding on the motherboard. It's very nice looking, although it is problematic and I will talk about why later on. I'm using two different drives, one one terabyte SN850, obviously to make the most of the PCIe Gen 4 speeds and then one older drive just for storage purposes because I happen to have it knocking about and I wanted to be able to show where you would install those. So you need to take the cover off that motherboard and then install it. Now usually, I've done a video on this separately, but usually you want to make sure you install your SSD in the top slot on the motherboard because that generally has the most lanes. So you get the most speed out of that. Sometimes you'll find if you have two or three M2 ports on your motherboard that if you install it in other positions you get slower speeds. So even though you've got NVMe PCIe Gen 4 you might actually find it running at Gen 3 speeds or slower and that's obviously not ideal. The process is fairly straightforward. In here you push it into a little clip and then there's a tiny little screw that comes in a bag with the motherboard that you basically push that down and hold it in there. I've done a video separately on this drive and the installation process for it and getting Windows to recognize it that I'll link to in the description. And also just to note, there's also another video that I've done on the different NVMe speeds and what that can mean for your drives and how to work that out. So that's worth checking out too. And then you basically can reseat the housing over the top. Let's hold in place with clips and a little bit fiddly I found with the bottom one. You will notice it hanging off at one point. So this is an older Samsung drive that was basically less important as a 500 gig, but I'm gonna be using that for the Windows install and then use the other one for games and other things. I generally recommend having more than one drive if you can manage it, but these M2 NVMEs are much easier to install than hard disk drives or SSDs because they don't require any power connections. They're basically plug and play. You do obviously need a screwdriver to screw them down and to take this housing off, but they're far less hassle generally to install than other things. Again, this has another plate that you need to then install over the top. One of the other things about this motherboard is it doesn't have any sort of thermal pads that's over there, so it's fairly weird. It does have this protective housing, but it's plastic on one side and that is the side that sits nearer the M2 drive, but it doesn't seem to sit over it, so not gonna be an issue potentially. So now we're going back to the tower cooler, and as I said, we're gonna plug it in at the top left here to the CPU connection. This may vary on your motherboard. I've seen somewhere it's more on the right-hand side. You're basically just looking for the marking that says CPU fan. Sometimes that's below the CPU, sometimes it's above it on the left, sometimes it's above it on the right, but we're looking for that connection. This varies from all-in-one coolers. I've done plenty of all-in-one cooler videos if you want to check those out. Usually they're plugged into AIO pump or AIO fan headers instead. The CPU tower is now ready to go for the most part, but we need to access this screw. So there's two screws on the other side and there's a fan in the way. So you have to take that middle fan out. It's held in place with two clips. This is very similar to the Noctua tower coolers and essentially a really easy, straightforward process for it removing the fan and installing the tower. And then you put the fan back. You do need to make sure that you put the fan back in the same direction though, because the way it's installed is designed to suck cold air from the front of the case. 
So both fans face the same direction to pull air through the rad and exhaust it out the rear. You need to be able to use this screwdriver tool to then access those pins and screw it down onto the motherboard. So going back to the motherboard, we're now going to apply the thermal paste. People in the comments will no doubt tell me I've done this wrong. There's too much or not enough, depending on your personal thoughts on the matter. But the manual says four points on each corner and then a blob in the middle. Also found temps ran pretty decent after doing it this way. So I'm pretty happy with that set up. And then we need to go about the process of removing this sticker. Don't forget to take that off and seating the tower. Now, once again, make sure you're facing this towards the front of the case. So the fan's front needs to face towards what will be the front of the case, which is to the right towards the right with the rear facing the left so we're seating that down you have to put it down where the two screws meet the top of the bracket so there's two pins sticking out of the brackets that we installed earlier and you're basically pushing those down onto there quite gently do need to be gentle and it does require a little bit of maneuvering around in order to get into position and then we use the tool to tighten it up and screw it down so it's held in place really nicely a little bit fiddly to do but basically keep tightening that until you can't tighten it anymore, but be careful not to over tighten it. So don't go too rough with it. Then reseating the fan back in place again and making sure that you put those clips in place so that it's held onto the tower and also that you're doing it the right way around. Once again, they need to both face the same direction. So the air is gonna get sucked through the, each of the towers and out the rear. This cooling setup is actually really nice, very, very quiet and also really nice looking I think, a nice addition in terms of white and black sort of contrasted theme that we've got going on so far with the RAM and the motherboard and elements of the case as well that you've already seen and you will see in a minute. So a good choice, reasonably affordable and pretty good at its job too actually from what I've seen. I'll link to that video in the description if you want to find out more and check that out. But here you can see what I was talking about earlier on about how there's a decent amount of room for the RAM as well so it's not pressing up against the RAM. Now you run those cables, the two cables from the fans up to the top. Obviously we're gonna have an excess of cabling that I was talking about. On this motherboard there's actually a little nice notch at the top as well where you can sort of tuck things away. But you could potentially run these cables through to the back and then potentially back to the front again inside the case and hide some of the mess at the rear because you can see there's quite a lot of cable there. We also need to run it in a position where it's not gonna be pressing up against the heat pipes and then obviously getting some of that heat from there and potentially damaging the cables over time because that wouldn't be ideal and then plugging it into the CPU fan header on the top there. This is the finished product and we're now ready to install this basically in the case you see everything's ready to go. I like doing this outside of the case because it just makes things a lot more accessible and then once you've done that you can set it in here. Once again this is an ATX motherboard so it's already basically ready to go and ready to install. If you're using a different size, you may find you need to use some of those standoffs to position them in the various different points that you can actually install the motherboard into the case. But you'll see it fits really well. There's still a lot of space going on here with an ATX motherboard as well. One of the things I did find with this motherboard though is that front protective casing, the white casing that sits around the outside of it, that's actually really difficult to get the motherboard screws through which is a major annoyance about this i had to basically push them quite hard through the gaps in order to install them and that's a bit strange because it's basically a protective of shielding that then makes it more difficult for you to install them but one of the things that you will see from this position as well is that the gpu anti-sag bracket on the right hand side is really far away from the motherboard when you've got an ATX motherboard and unless you've got a really long GPU it's probably not going to reach all the way over there but I'll show you a little bit later on how we'll adjust the positioning of that and sort that out so it's in a better place which is pretty nice that you can do that and I think that's a really nice addition is the small things about this case that make it the fact it comes with RGB fans that are easily controllable too is really cool. Then the CPU power connections that I was talking about earlier on one of them can be split in half because we need an eight pin and a four pin so we're going to take those and then run them through so the ones i tidied up earlier on on the right hand side of the case which is now the left depending on which way around you're looking at it i then need to run these in now this is one of the reasons why you might be better off installing if you're doing a tower like i am once it's already installed in the case because what i found is it's really fiddly and hard to get those power cables in with that tower in the way and i happen to have small hands i found it really fiddly and awkward 
so I've made it my life more inconvenient. But I've done that for you. So if you appreciate that, smash that subscribe button and drop me a comment. But basically install the motherboard first and then the tower after you've plugged in all the cables because you'll find a lot less sort of faff with trying to get those cables in there and a lot less frustration. Now once that's done and those cables are well installed, I'm going back to tidying them up a bit more. There are multiple loops at the back here which are ideal for these top cables. So you can see you can secure them down really nicely and basically ensure that they're all tightened up and out of the way, which I think is worth doing. You get a lot of cable ties both with the power supply unit and also with the case. There's plenty of cables for tidying things up and making them neat. There are still a lot of cables to look at for this case though, which can seem a bit intimidating, but don't worry, I'm going to show you where they go in a second. And then I'm running the 24 pin power supply cable through the rubber gap at the side so that we can basically put those through. This is the USB front panel connections for the top of the case. So you plug in USB A and then you also have HD audio. So that's the 3.5 mil connections for the front that goes into the bottom of the case. And I'll show you where that connects in a second. And then USB-C, that also goes near where the power supply cable goes. And then we have the hard disk drive LED and power switch cables for the case as well. There's no reset switch on this, just a power button. And that's interesting. So less cables to plug into the motherboard there is actually one of the biggest pains usually is plugging in all those cables and trying to work out where they go. So it's actually quite nice. And then you'll see we have multiple other cables that look kind of messy. Actually, you don't really need to panic about these. For the most part, the fan cables, as I said, are already connected up. There's one loose one that you can see here from the rear, so another 120 mil. But what I've discovered is that there is actually another daisy chainable connector here from the front fan. So they've actually connected up three fans and they've left the other one disconnected. But you can actually tie that into the loops so that you can have all of them controlled for one connector. So you see you can find the connection where that will actually clip in and connect up with the others. There's some RG, there's an RGB one and then there's also this one which is the fan power. So what I've done is connect that up like that. You could alternatively just find another system fan header on your motherboard and connect it up there. Because essentially I'm running four fans off one cable which might not be ideal depending on your motherboard setup. But I'm going to run that through to the front and plug it into system fan header one. And you can basically do that from the bottom. So that's on the bottom of my motherboard. You'll have to look at your motherboard manual and work out where your sys fan headers are. You should find multiple different fan connectors on the motherboard that you can plug fans into with relative ease. So as I said earlier on, the most important cable is the 24 pin power supply cable. We need to make sure that is well connected and seated. Generally, it's a bit fiddly to plug in and a bit awkward to maneuver, but because there's no cable hiding trays or anything like that, I actually found it really easy this time, really easy to seat down and then to manipulate. So most of it's at the rear and it's not too messy and not too much of a fuss. So fairly straightforward. This is the USB-C connection. Again, that's for the front of the top of the case. So you make sure that's connected up. That sits just below the 24 pin power supply cable. That's usually in the same place. Again, a closer look at that. I'm doing this outside the case just to show you what you do. And essentially it's on the right hand side. This is also a different power supply cable, but I just wanted to show you how it plugs in and how it connects up. Now the other chunky one, that's the USB-A connectors. So the USB-A on the front panel. On this motherboard, it plugs in on the side just there. There's also another one at the bottom. You'll look for one with multiple pins on. You do need to take real care when plugging this in because it's really easy to bend the pins on that, I found in my experience. And then HD audio then plugs in at the bottom left of the motherboard generally. Again, you have to refer to your manual to see where it is. But on this motherboard, it sits on the bottom left. And that allows you to plug in headsets. So 3.5 mil headsets and microphones can be plugged in to the front panel. And you can see that front audio on the left hand side here. This is also the RGB connection. So you'll see that there is a three pin RGB connection that plugs in the bottom left. You can do that if you need to for the RGB controller because you can use that RGB controller to sync the fans instead of with the case button, which I'll show you later on, with the motherboard RGB controls if you want to that's an option or if you don't have that you can just use the case connections which is pretty cool and this is the system fan connection so that's the fan that's all four of the fans connected up to one cable and plugged into the bottom again I'm using sys fan one which is on the bottom of the motherboard there fairly straightforward setup and then the two connections for the power 
and the LED, so basically lets you know when things are running nicely and lets you turn your PC on, which is obviously pretty important, so pretty essential. You will see that that is in the bottom right of the motherboard, and you can see the markings of what things are, but that's F panel, and we're looking for the power button power switch which is in the sort of top right of that so a little bit fiddly again refer to your manual and your motherboard because you might find a slightly different positioning and slightly different logic but the setup there is a little bit fiddly and it's quite difficult to demonstrate in this position as well but hopefully that's been fairly clear now a quick look again at the rgb controller at the rear so this little controller has the three front fans plugged in we've already plugged a sata power in so it's got power but you also get this additional rgb cable what you'll find is the rgb connections are daisy chain from the fans and then connected up into this controller what you can do instead is you can take out the daisy chaining from the fans and you can connect it up so you'll find the relevant one and you'll see that it's a very small one with these sort of sideways clips on it what we're looking to do is connect it up to this cable instead if you want to control the rgb from your motherboard so you do that and then you run that cable down to the bottom and plug it into the rgb controller that i showed don't forget that you need to remove the power from the rgb controller though because it will all be done through your motherboard instead and you don't want to confuse things by having both so now we've got the majority of things installed the next thing to do is to install the graphics card so we're going to remove the couple of plates at the back now always go for the top slot the pcie x16 slot on your motherboard when installing gpu that usually has the fastest port and the most number of lanes and it will give you the best success one thing i found here which i think is actually down to the motherboard rather than the case is it was a bit fiddly to install this one this is a 3060 ti and it was actually really hard to push into place i think the housing on the motherboard was preventing it from going in but if you have trouble and you've got a different motherboard then perhaps it is down to the case a little bit as well i'm not sure so i can't say with 100 percent certainty what it was but i did find i had to force it in a bit more than i normally would which is quite scary make sure you put the screws back in after that now you'll see that the gpu anti-sag bracket is well away from the 3060 not much use here as i said you can have up to a 380 mil gpu potentially in this case so if you've got a much longer one then you could use it there but the nice thing is that you can easily take it off so there are some screws at the back i didn't need a screwdriver to loosen them but where that plate is you can unscrew that so if you unscrew them all the way you can then remove it entirely you can also just loosen it and move it up and down depending on when you need it but you'll notice on the other side on the right hand side of all the cables there is another point for it so you can see the bracket here it basically just has those two little thumb screws and then an adjustable plate with like a rubberized bit on it where it will sit and stop the gpu from sagging over time so this will reduce the sag on that it's a nice addition it's a really nice addition you don't often see that included in cases so a simple little thing that makes it worthwhile basically we need to just position it now where it will be sitting nicely for the gpu work out where that is hold it in place and then reseat the thumb screws a little bit fiddly to do at this angle i think if you're doing it with the case standing up and hands on either side it'll be a little bit easier but for the purposes of trying to capture it on video i had to do it in a really awkward way so it did shift around a little bit but basically managed to get one of the thumb screws in and then screw the other one in and then you just need to position it properly make sure it's held in the right place and then tighten them up again a little bit fiddly to do but it does work and it is really nice addition and very simple and well thought out just a little bit of tightening up and you're away you've got and then you've got a nice bracket that can be adjusted and prevent your gpu from sagging down over time i don't think this 3060 will sag to be honest but if you have a much longer one uh, that's quite heavy then over time it'll start to droop and obviously that's problematic so now the final thing to do is to connect up the power connection so this is pcie connections for the gpu that i ran in earlier you may find you need multiple connections on your graphics card so hopefully you knew that before you plugged in all these cables in otherwise you're going to have to reach around to the back and plug in an extra pcie cable and i apologize if you've got this far i should have mentioned it earlier don't hate me and now we're finished now on top of the case you'll see that you have power connection and you also have that led button the led button is what controls the rgb lighting assuming you haven't connected it up to your case rgb so as standard the fans actually have multiple different rgb lighting effects and you can switch between them by simply just pressing the button on the front which is pretty nifty 
I do think one downside of this is that that rear fan isn't RGB. I don't know why they didn't include a, a rear one RGB. I'd like to see it. Just pay a little bit extra and have four RGB fans. That would have been amazing. Because it's really simple to set up. As you've seen, this case was actually really joyful and straightforward to install. Really hassle-free and pleasant. And you can see the results of the RGB lighting here and what you can do with it. Just press that button change between various different effects they're not the fanciest rgb fans i've seen the blades don't light up the outside doesn't light up it's just some rgb in the middle and once you put the cover back on you don't see loads and loads of it but i still think it looks quite nice and actually all the fans are really quiet as well as that my main experience and takeaway from this build is that all the fans are surprisingly quiet and it runs really cool as an entire system if you want to find out more about the temps on how this does check out the link to the cooler video in the description at the end of that video i talk through the performance of that and the overall noise level this has been the provoke brawn this has been the provoke brawn hope you found this video useful interesting hilarious or otherwise take a look at these other videos that i think you might find interesting as well and have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my youtube channel and most importantly have a great life